good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brimmy Balaram. I'm a senior researcher in the economy team here at the RSA. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's special event. So just a quick note before we begin, could you please make sure your, your phones are turned to silent? We are filming today's event and live streaming over the web. So welcome to everyone joining us online. And a reminder that the hashtag is RSA Human if you'd like to get involved in the conversation on Twitter. So I do hope you will share your thoughts and views with us today because it's a great privilege to be joined by a distinguished keynote speaker who is going to give us a lot of food for thought, I'm sure. So Douglas Reshkoff is an award-winning author, broadcaster, and documentarian who studies human autonomy in the digital age. The host of the popular Team Human, po Team Human podcast, Douglas is a regular columnist and has written 20 books, including the bestsellers Present Shock and Program or Be Programmed. He made the PBS frontline documentaries Generation Like and Merchants of Cool, coined such concepts as viral media and social currency, and has been a leading voice for applying digital media towards social and economic justice. Douglas is a research fellow of the Institute for the Future and founder of the Lab for Digital Humanism at CUNY Queens, where he's a professor, pr professor of media theory and digital economics. Douglas joins us today to share some of his latest thinking from his new book, Team Human. In the book and in his talk for us today, Douglas explores the challenges that digital age technologies present to our collective autonomy and invites us to remake society towards human ends rather than the end of humans. It's a topic that goes to the heart of much of the work that the RSA is currently carrying out, a great deal of which focuses on the human impact of economic and technological change and looks to create opportunities to engage citizens themselves in the design and development of new technologies in ways that are ethical, inclusive, and just. So it really is a special pleasure to hear from Douglas today, and I'm looking forward to, hearing, to learning a lot from our conversation and to hearing your thoughts. Uh, so there will be plenty of time for you to actually contribute before we wrap up at 2 p.m. And without further ado, let's get started. Please join me in, in giving Douglas Rushkoff a warm welcome. <laughs> Thanks. I jotted down some notes. I guess I can use, but but I'm hoping to speak really briefly so we can have more of a more of a conversation. Partly, uh, really, as an exercise in what I'm arguing in in Team Human that 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 being human is a team sport, and we do it better together. And you can read the equivalent of a lecture, you know, or look at some watch some video and see me present, but you know, if we're going to have a live event in a room, it might as well be a live event in a room. People came together to, to interact, not just to, to, to receive. Um, but I'll launch a little, and then just so that you got some, something to respond to. And you can be mean if you want. It's OK, because she's obviously nice. So you could be you know, mean um, to, to progress things forward. Uh, I, I, as, as just a, you know, just, Stupid American. I thought the RSA was just Royal Society of Arts. You know, I didn't know until you know I, I was almost here already that there was also like arts, manufacturing, and commerce. And to me, the fact that it's well, the fact that it's shocking to hear all three of those in the same organization is is almost the main symptom that I'm trying to address. You know. I, it, it's sometimes I see I see art as anathema to commerce and, and manufacturing, almost as if art is the way that we're going to defend ourselves against the you know the evils of growth-based corporate capitalism, and that what I've been trying to do really in my my mission for the last decade or so has been to try to retrieve human values and embed them in. Uh, in technology, in commerce, in uh, even in, in capitalism to the extent that we can. And then I hear about this place, it's like RSA and MNC. Uh, it's like, okay, so maybe the, the initial vision of this institution was that these various forces can, can not only be balanced or leveraged against each other, but contribute to each other in a positive way, which in modern times seems kind of 
shocking, uh, but, but shouldn't be. You know, the, the problem that I'm trying to address is that human beings think of ourselves in terms of our utility value. And that's going to be the, mean the end of us. And partly because machines have more utility value than people. You know, we can always develop a machine that will have more utility value than, than a human being. This is kind of what Norbert Wiener was arguing back in the, in the guy who came up with cybernetics when he was thinking about feedback mechanisms and the first robots, that we're going to have to think about what's the human use of human beings. And it doesn't even mean the humane use of human beings, but the human use of human beings. I hate the humane as a, as a term. We've got now in the States, we have a, a, what's it called? The Center for Humane Technology. And I, I understand it's a sweet idea, right? The former uh, captologists of Facebook and Instagram, the people who were programming these platforms with the Las Vegas slot machine algorithms to addict people, feel guilty about what they've done. And so they create the Center for Humane Technology to teach Facebook and others how to make platforms that treat humans more humanely, which to me sounds like, you know, the way we treat cage-free chickens. Right? Let's treat them more humanely before we slaughter them and eat them. So here, let's treat the humans more humanely before we take their data and their money and program them into submission. We could do that in a more humane fashion. But to me, it, it bespeaks of a reversal of figure and ground, a reversal of subject and object. We're thinking about how does technology treat humans rather than how do human beings use technology. Right? So we are no longer the figures. We are no longer the actors. You know, the, the intelligent agents have agency. So we've ended up living in a world where even those who want to make technology in theory, that, that's nicer to people, are still thinking about technology as something that plays us. And that's the experience I have, and, and, and that I believe is, is, is real right now, is that I'm not using my technology. My technology uses me. Every time I swipe my smartphone, it gets smarter about me, and I get dumber about it. Right? I don't even know what the algorithms are, because they're in black box proprietary wall, you know, uh, they're, they're protected because of uh, whatever, you know, regulations are, are surrounding proprietary, te proprietary technology. So I can't even know what it's doing to me. And if we think about technology as a way to play humans, then what are the humans? Right? The humans are the objects. And I think it goes back way before digital technology. It goes back to really to the dawn of the industrial age or maybe before. It's whenever people use people. You know, I mean, we had slavery since you know, biblical times, but uh, the industrial age really uh, created a kind of a softer, kinder, uh, kinder gent gentler version of, of slavery, you know, where we started to understand human beings as a, in terms of their ability to contribute uh, contribute to the market, whether it was uh, uh, separating human workers from the value they created by forcing them to become employees of chartered monopolies rather than small business people, or whether it was looking at you know people in territory as just you know regions to regions in which to expand and extract value from, that we ended up with a, a an anti-human bias in the way we understand business and development is always this compromise of human dignity. And we ended up now, uh, in spite of what, what we <coughs> like to tell ourselves in our, in our churches and, and in psychotherapy sessions, you know, we, we tell ourselves that we have no intrinsic value, that somehow it's superstitious to think that human beings come into the world with dignity, with some essential value, that we have to prove your worth. You know, and I, I was lucky. I was, you know, raised with television that uh, I had Mr. Do you have Mr. Rogers here in the UK? Mr. Rogers was this wonderful uh, uh, ch children's show, and he would tell you at the end of each show, you're special just the way you are. And I believe that. I'm special, that I had value just the way I am, that I have 
value. And if we don't understand people as having some sort of essential human value, then we're going to think of human beings as a means to an end, rather than an end in ourselves. You know, and it's not just this sort of uh, capitalistic treadmill that we end up on, but we end up with a society that really hates humans, that really we, we loathe ourselves. In the States, everybody's obsessed with the zombie shows, with the Walking Dead show. And you think about Walking Dead, what's the message of the Walking Dead? What, what is each one of those episodes about? It's a person usually staring at the horizon at some zombie walking. And they zoom in on the person, the human's face, and you can see in the person's eyes that they're thinking, what's really the difference between me and the zombie? Right? The zombie walks, I walk. The zombie eats, I eat. The zombie kills, and I kill. And then you know, they fade out. <laughs> right? The difference is that they're fucking zombies, right? The zombies, they're not conscious, they're not alive, they're not willful, they don't talk to each other, they don't make love, they don't, they don't have any of the things that make humans human. Right? If you understand humans in terms of our inputs and outputs, then yeah, we are no different. We are just zombies. And I ended up, and this is the whole motivation to write Team Human, to even start talking about Team Human, was I was on a, a panel with a famous transhumanist who was arguing about the singularity. And he was saying that, you know, when the singularity comes, you know, the moment that computers are smarter than people, that human beings should accept our fate and pass the evolutionary torch to technology. <laughs> that all evolution is, is information looking for more complex uh, hosts. So information found atoms, then molecules, and organelles, and organisms, human culture, then technology. And once technology is more complex than people, then information will evolve beyond us. And then we should really only stick around insofar as we're needed to keep the lights on for the computers. And after that, we should gracefully accept our extinction. And I said, no, no, human beings are special. I made my little impassioned human argument. You know, that people are weird, that we can stay in liminal states and in between places that computers can't. Human beings can embrace paradox and sustain ambiguity over time. We can watch a David Lynch movie and not understand what it means and still find that pleasurable. Right? So what is that? Computers can't do that. We deserve a place in the digital future. And he said, oh, Rushkoff, you're just saying that because you're human self-interested, you know, some, some you know, species chauvinism. And I said, all right, fine, I'm human. I'm on Team Human. And, you know, that was when I, I sort of came up with that meme of Team Human. And, uh, but then as I thought about it, I mean it even in more ways than just I'm on Team Human. I mean that being human is a team sport, that we actually are a collective thing. We are a group organism, whether we can realize it at all times or not. And that's where we get our power. That's where we get our strength. You know, the, 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 the rapport is the prerequisite to solidarity. And solidarity is our power as humans against the very systems of our own creation, whether they're, you know, the capitalism or, or t t techno solutionism or the blockchain or whatever it is that's, that's coming for us. Uh, when we are together, we have power. But we've developed a digital landscape that is programmed to atomize us, that is programmed to alienate us from one another, to make us see one another as adversaries rather than as friends. That's what it's for, to get us to react, to devolve us to our brainstem, right? so that we are reacting to everything we see with this lizard mentality rather than using our frontal cortex. I mean, hell, the platforms are designed by children whose frontal cortex isn't even completely developed by the time they become CEOs, right? The, the, myelin, sheath ha the myelin sheaths haven't completely developed ar on their, uh, around their dendrites. They still have impulse control, and they are creating landscapes that are using the, the state-of-the-art behavioral economics to program our behaviors. So no wonder we're, we're feeling the way we are. You know, the, it, it seems... It, obvious to me, right? but the, the, the response that I'm trying to, to provoke is not another techno-solutionist response. I don't think it's about, let's write algorithms to beat the algorithms that are hurting us. 
You know, let's, you know, a new army of that, or let's develop a better social media network that does this, or a better smartphone algorithm. No, I think what, what I'm trying to do is a little bit more homeopathic in spirit, or naturopathic, rather than fighting the disease and even giving more weight and authority to that digital, oh, the digital monster, let's get offline. No, let's enhance our human resilience. Right? Let's in, in, enhance our own, our own vitality, our cultural immune response. You know, if there's weaponized memes out there, then I don't want my kid using a weaponized meme filter. I want my kid being strong enough to not respond to the weaponized meme. When, when in the States we had this uh, Twitter phenomenon where there was this video of some MAGA kid, a kid with a MAGA hat, facing off with a Native American. And it was like 20 seconds it started out, like this 20 second video. And I saw all my friends, smart friends, professors of media friends, and tweeting that, retweeting, my God, look at this horrible fascist child. And, what. and I, was, I was kind of amazed. It's like, wait a minute, can't you be a human being for a minute? Can't you be smart enough to realize you're not there? You don't know what happened. You're, re you're reacting to a picture on social media and using it to vent whatever the rage you have against the Trump presidency or against MAGA people or against racism or without knowing what you're friggin' talking about. And of course, you know, as they pull back, it became another story and they pull back a little bit more and it became yet another story. So the object of the game is not to teach Twitter how to make sure that these bad messages don't come through. That's like saying, well, let's just rid the world of viruses. No, the, the, the object of the game is to increase our own immune response as people, our collective cultural immune response. And the way to do that is to have enough solidarity between people who can sit in rooms together, make eye contact, have conversations, and not feel so threatened, right, that they can't tolerate, they can't tolerate one another. You know, every semester that I teach, I've only taught for five years now, every semester I get more notes from students on the first day of class, notes signed by their psychiatrists saying, please excuse Johnny from class participation and presentations. But because Johnny's got, you know, it's an anxiety, social anxiety. And I'm sure that's real, but why is there so much? Why hasn't Johnny been trained in kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, how to be in a room with other people? You know, it's because Johnny's education has been surrendered to Johnny's utility value. Let's make him a good worker. You know, anyone in, in the UK who knows the history of public education here, you, you know public education was not to make better workers. Public education was started to give dignity to the coal worker so that they'd be working in the mines all day, but at least they could come home and have the dignity of being able to read a novel or participate intelligently in, in representative democracy. When we turn education into extensions and to an extension of work, all we've really done is taken a corporate cost and externalized it to the public sector. And we've devalued education. So it's no longer teaching people that they have essential dignity when they come in that room. But they're going to have to learn something in order to be useful, valuable members of society. And the principals of the schools meet with the CEOs of the companies to find out, oh, what do you want them to know? Do you want them to know Excel? Do you want them to know Java? Do you want them to know Python? We'll deliver you the employee of the future. You know, and if you're an employee, there are no jobs in the future, but that's <laughs> another story. <laughs> right? Employment, but it's fine. Employment's temporary. We can talk about that. Employment was invented in the, in the Renaissance. It's not, it's not essential to work. It's just, it's really, employment was a way to prevent people from owning their own businesses. They had to go work for chartered monopolies. That's when employment was born. Uh, but that's, that's a whole other story. So yeah, so I'm arguing that once we can learn to establish and maintain basic rapport with one another, that's when the great human conspiracy can begin. And I mean it, the word conspiracy literally. Conspire means what? To breathe together. People breathing together right now, that constitutes a conspiracy. If you can breathe together with other people in a room, because then the whole thing, the whole artifice uh, uh, begins to unravel, you know, and you start to experience your, your power, and you start to experience the dignity of yourself and the dignity of the other people uh, that you're with. And once you touch that, that core of dignity in yourself and others, then uh, it's much, much harder uh, to be controlled by, by anyone or anything.
Okay, thanks. Let's let's talk with each other. Okay, thanks. That was great. That was really yeah. passionate. Um, so I just have a couple questions to get us started, and then we're gonna take some cool. questions from the audience. Um, so this book, to me, it seems like a call to arms, and it seems to draw some inspiration from Tim Leary's words, find the others, mm -hmm. um, to reinvigorate a movement of people who will resist capitalist norms like individualism and go against the grain of technological determinism. So I was actually wondering, who are you directing this call of arms to? Is it squarely aimed at people who are beginning to question the power of big tech, or did you have a wider audience in mind? I was also wondering, um, what about the people who still very much believe in the philosophy of Silicon Valley? Is there any hope of them joining this movement? And if so, how would you talk to them about what's in your book, what's in your book to bring them into the fold? Um, gosh, I mean, I, the, the audience is like the human race, I guess. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, specifically though, uh, you know, Westerners who are, you know, kind of trapped in this uh, uh, striving, uh, you know, people for whom reality is becoming more precarious. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who don't need this particular book. In some ways, it's the billionaires of Silicon Valley who do, mm -hmm. you know, because they, they're so, they feel so powerless. They feel so hopeless. You know, the billionaires of Silicon Valley really are stuck in that, in that, they're trying to earn enough money to insulate themselves from the reality that they're creating by earning money in that way. And they realize it's like they can't quite get in front of it. So I'm trying to help them see that they're like, they can't drive the car fast enough to escape their own exhaust. You know, that, that, that the world, it's, it, that we're contained. Um, and, but I have to do it in a way that's not so frightening. To, so it's not, dude, you're gonna suffocate. Mm -hmm. But no, you actually, rather than you know, hiring futurists to tell you what's gonna happen and then preparing for the inevitable, you have the power to create the future that you wanna see. Um, so, you know, they're, but they're sort of the most hopeless. I, I was funny, I, I compared them this morning, I was talking about how in the, uh, in the Bible that, that God uh, hardened Pharaoh's heart it was like right between the second and the third plague. He was trying to make a better uh, adversary. And the idea of hardening someone's heart, it, he took away Pharaoh's free will. And I feel like that's what's happened to some of these guys. They've gotten so entrenched in these systems that they've, they've lost their free will. And so they're, they're, they're kind of no longer, I hate to say it, but they're kind of no longer human, or they're no longer acting human. You know, they're, the, they're more victimized by their own systems than we are. Because they don't know, they, they've built these operating systems without being conscious of the operating system underneath it. They're completely aware that corporate capitalism is a construct. They think mm -hmm. it's just nature because they're children when they start these companies, right? And they leave their professors at university when they're, you know, freshmen or sophomores and they turn to these Silicon Valley investors as their new kind of parent figures and they just buy into this thing. And so, uh, the poor things, poor babies, really. And then, you know, once they have a hundred billion, they realize, oh my gosh, all right, I'll give it all, shove it all back in there somehow. And it's like, you know, too late, you, you too much. You can't just shove it back in. Um, I mean, you can do so, you can give it away, I guess, but it doesn't, I mean, you've, you've already, it's like trying to, you know, after you, you decimate the topsoil and then, oh, we'll just shove some Monsanto nutrients back in there. And, you know, and it's alive, right? It's like, no, it's, you kind of killed the, the, the ecosystem. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess this is meant more for, for, for people who feel hopeless, for people who are atomized, mm -hmm. for you know, people who are already in communities and doing things and have solidarity, they kind of don't need it, although it's good to have, sometimes it's good to have argue, arguing points, you know? Yeah, I found that helpful. Yeah. Um, and so my next question was, once we find the others, what next? So I agree that transformation happens at a local level, um, but how can we scale it? So, for example, if I was to seek out like-minded folk in my, er in my local er area of East London and we set up a cooperative grocery store to compete with um, the likes of Tesco's and Amazon delivery, what sort of dent does that make in the wider capitalist system? And how can we sustain 
let alone um, encourage lateral scaling of similar initiatives given the money and the might behind these bigger players? I think uh, scale could be a false goal. In other words, industrialism scales. <coughs> mm -hmm. And I understand what you're saying laterally scale. In other words, I think, I mean, when I look at, at what real people can do, I think they can do it locally more successfully than they can globally. Mm -hmm. you know, so I have uh, so many well-meaning kids, kids, people, email me and say, oh, I want to create a website that's going to aggregate all the solutions from all the blah, blah. And everybody wants to like somehow capture the whole thing, but very few people want to just do it because it feels like it's not real if it hasn't got a million followers and hasn't scaled out. But I think that the real solution, the real solutions are going to be this diversity of solutions so that the, the solution for a co-op in uh, a grocery co-op in East London is going to be different than the solution for commonsing water in East Nigeria. You know, so uh, I'm not, uh, I, I like the idea of having the models, so then all the different people that are looking to do uh, uh, local co-op groceries can see, oh, look what they tried here, look what they tried there, or let's take this little piece of that model and this little piece of that model, and then, yeah, if they can all network, then they get buying power together. So we're kind of talking about anarcho-syndicalism, you know, where you have all these different cottage industries and, and worker-owned cooperatives that are all independently operating, but they're networked to the point that they can leverage certain, uh, you know, collective power and all. But uh, it's like that's so many steps down the line. So yeah, first I'm saying learn to tolerate other people. You know, <laughs> just to be with people. So I'm in that first step. I've, I've basically gotten, hopefully gotten people through the first two hours of it. But then um, they're all going to have, I, I, I hesitate to say, oh, this is the way I would model this, and this is the way I would model that, because it's the way I would, mm -hmm. I would model it. I mean, and there's tools out there. There's great, I mean, I like Lumio as a tool. You know, it's, a, it's out of New Zealand. It's, it takes the General Assembly um, consensus building discussion structure from the Occupy movement and put it online so the communities can uh, kind of argue out issues in a different way than sort of parliamentary politics does with the yes-no debate. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of tools out there, but, uh, but yeah, I, I do think we make a dent collectively in a distributed fashion. I don't think we necessarily make a dent by trying to create another giant phantom structure to battle the corporation. You know, the, 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 the corporation is a non-player character in this big video game. And the non-player character is the native of this virtual realm. But humans, have a home field advantage on the planet. You know, we actually do. Adam Smith was even writing about this, that the small, the, the small scale local business should have all of these advantages if we understand how to leverage them. Cool, yeah, like, I would like to see a diversity of business models. I guess I'm just saying, within our system, we do have this tendency now towards monopoly power, and like, what are some of the systemic solutions that we can also advocate for? Thank you. Um, so that we can actually have this flourishing local cooperative. Yeah, I mean, they're simple. <laughs> Worker ownership, platform mm -hmm. co-ops, um, you know, under helping people understand about the, uh, uh, the velocity of money. Why is it better to earn, you know, the same dollar 10 times as it circulates through a community than to take $10 and earn it once and extract it from the community? So as people, it's a bit, you know, I, I look at economics the way like Dyson looks at the vacuum cleaner. You know, how do you create those sort of circular turbine um, uh, phenomena? And it's, it's not that hard. It's just people have to realize, and this is the hardest part right now, that just because the price is lower doesn't mean the cost is lower. Right? The price is lower, but the cost is higher. And, and, and I was just talking to a black cab driver last night, and he was like, why do, why, why do, he was arguing against Uber, and he was saying, why do people think that cab drivers don't deserve to live a life of dignity? It was really interesting to me. He was like, people don't, they wouldn't want to be paid that little, so why do they think it's okay 
for us to be paid that little. And it really kind of comes down to that in the end. To, to, and of course, if we're just not, don't need as much stuff. You know, right now, we're, we're buying so much stuff, and we're, we're, we're doing that for, for all sorts of silly reasons. Yeah, we all need more Marie Kondo in our lives. Um, OK, I'm going to take some questions from the audience. So I'm going to take two at a time. Um, so I will take this woman over here and this gentleman. And the mics are going to come around. If you can just speak directly into the mic, that would be great. <laughs> No, it's not. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> um, you made technology seem like a disease. And I don't think that it is. I think that it is more of an addiction. And we can't build, we can't build, we can't be more resilient to technology. However, I don't think it's a human duty. I think if we could pass a piece of legislation that would have age restrictions for using technology, it would be better for us that rather than like fighting technology. Uh, well, yeah, it's an addiction, so I would say technologism. I don't know what it's. <laughs> well, yeah. So, and I think that. We're not addicted to technology because it's addictive by nature. I think we are addicted to the leisure that we get from it. And it didn't become addictive because it, be like it was a trend. It is, it is just too convenient for us to use technology these days. And uh, to let go of it is just, it's unrealistic at this point. But I also think that fighting it on our own and even though like in a community is also like a little bit unrealistic. So what what would do you what do you suggest about that? Thank you. And just this question over here. Just behind you. Glasses. <laughs> yeah, hello Mr. Rushkoff. Um uh, fascinated to hear some of your thoughts. Um, my question really is connected to something that was reported on the BBC News website recently. Um, and on the national news, uh, there was a girl called Holly, um, or Molly rather, Russell, 14 years old, who had been using Instagram. Um, she had been searching images connected to self-harming uh, and topics connected to suicide. She eventually took her life and her father uh, gave an incredibly dignified um, report to the BBC. And he expressed, I think, some of the things that you're expressing to here today, that um, the algorithms just fed her daughter with the same topics that she, she was searching, namely self-harm and suicide. And he said that this partly led to her suicide. So my question is this, if you're suggesting that we shouldn't go down the, okay, let's create an edifice, as you just referred to it, where you, you get a kind of a, a fight with kind of positive algorithms, uh, which might redirect somebody in a positive direction. But you're saying, let's build up the cultural uh, you know, immune response my, my question is, is there a place for positive algorithms to fight these negative ones, uh, number one? And if not, what does the positive cultural immune response look like for somebody who's vulnerable and, and suffering from mental health problems like Molly was? Yeah, I mean, these questions are obviously related. Um, I'm not trying to say that technology is a disease at all. I'm a pro-technology, I'm a technology enthusiast. I'm a digital enthusiast. I'm an original cyberpunk. I just think that we could embed technology with pro-human uh, uh, pro uh, routines. We could, we could optimize technology for humans rather than optimizing humans through technology. You know, and that's, that's the, the change I'm, I'm looking to do. So um, it doesn't mean, I mean, I don't think there's an algorithm to solve it all. I mean, and, and part of it, I don't want us to relinquish our real world human social contact and, and solidarity 
to just to think, oh, well, we don't have to worry about it. We'll, we'll get a law or we'll get a better tech or get a good Facebook rather than a bad Facebook and that'll be okay. That, that there's a wake-up call in this of like, oh, wait a minute, our, our human physical reality, the 500 years or 500,000 years of evolved social mechanisms that we are um, dispensing with right now as we spend our time on Skype, that we, we really should retrieve those, that we, we are... Um, we are untethered without them. So we need to reify that. So with young people, I say, let's find, try to find 10 minutes a week where you sit with other people in a non-mediated way just to try to, to, to prime the pump. Just, so that's not anti-tech. It's just saying, let's get that 10 minutes going. Start with that and see if you can get it up to 20 minutes. And it's unbearable for some people to take 10 full minutes. I mean, they know they've done it, but to do it consciously and say, I'm going to take 10 minutes and be there, again, that's not an anti-tech message. It's just a pro-human message, you know, a pro, uh, so you can have both. So spend the other, you know, however many minutes there are a week on Facebook, but take that 10 just to, to, to elicit that, that moment. Um, I agree that, that from there. So it's not the tech, it's the way we program the tech. We're programming the tech with all of these anti-human biases that far predate the digital age. You know, they're the, the biases of industrialism that, you know, we're, we're still bad under industrialism, but when we program them into a technological infrastructure, when we teach algorithms, tell algorithms, get this person to do, click on more things by any means necessary, the algorithm's going to figure out what those means are. And the means that they figured out was, well, let's show them increasingly more extreme versions of the thing that they're interested in, which is the nature of addiction. You get the first dose for free, and now a little stronger, and now a little stronger, and then this girl went down, you know, went down that uh, reality tunnel. It's really hard, and it's not, I mean, young people are vulnerable, but so are people with uh, mental health issues are, are increasingly vulnerable, and suicide is in, in the millennial generation is way up and in, in teenagers. So again, I mean, what's the ultimate expression of an anti-human, of an anti-human bias? Well, so if you just kill myself or collectively, let's just end our civilization, which is sort of what, where we're going. Let's just end this thing. And I'll even talk to environmentalists who say, well, is it really so bad? You know, humans, screwed up the world to begin with, so now they're going to go, and maybe things will be better after us. And so I get it from both sides, you know, the most progressives and the most regressives all hate us. I mean, <laughs> so if we had a culture that was more pro stay alive. I don't want to say pro-life because it sounds, you know, <laughs> anti-women, anti but more pro-sustainability pro uh, on an individual, on a collective basis. Um, I think we'd reduce some of the impulse. But yeah, I mean, the, the social media companies today are, and I wrote about this like five years ago, are like cigarette companies were 10, 20 years ago. They have all the research. They know how bad this is. They, they know. You know, they know, and they are there with Sheryl Sandberg and all their other PR people trying to make George Soros look like, you know, a, a bad guy when they are leading to suicides. You know, they are leading, their, their algorithms are killing people. Uh, so it is, I mean, I, don't you guys have the NIH? Is that owned by corporations or is that still National Institutes of Health? Do you have that? Isn't there a, I mean, I, in America, it's just all of our, all of our, everything's gotten so corrupted now. You know, it's like the industry owns the regulatory agencies. Um, but, you know, in Europe, sometimes it seems like people still go, wait a minute, uh, there's, a, there's a, a public health issue here. And that is a good, that's a great way to push things. I, I'm also thinking people, uh, Facebook's entrenchment is, is less permanent than it may seem. You know, back, I remember back in the day when AOL bought Time Warner. And everyone thought, oh my God, so AOL really is going to own the whole friggin' internet and all media and all that. I wrote the op-ed for the New York Times. They asked me to write an op-ed. And I said, oh, if AOL bought Time Warner, this is the end. 
<laughs> this is the end. I mean, of them. It means that they're cashing in their overvalued chips to buy a real company. It means we've reached peak AOL. Yay, let's see what happens. And the New York Times wouldn't publish it. They said it was insane to argue that, that obviously this is, you know, this is the long boom that, that even uh, uh, Alan Greenspan and the Fed, this is the infinite expansion of the market. Um, and the Guardian published it, thank you very much. Um, I thank you as the representative of this whole country. Um, even though she's from Toronto, yeah, I think you're Canada. Uh, but but uh, I, and I, I think the same thing. I think people, as they get just nauseous, you know, and that's, I'm trying to wake people up, what, how does this make me feel? You know, back to Timothy Leary. If you real, Timothy Leary said that the, the internet was like acid, like LSD, as powerful as LSD. And if you realize that internet is as powerful as LSD, America, the world, the Western world is living on a psychedelic substrate called the internet, only we're having a bad trip. Right? Because we've had, we didn't realize that you've got to be, acknowledge your, mind, your set and your setting, your mindset and the setting. So the mindset is individual survival. The setting is corporate capitalism. Where is that going to take you on your acid trip? Not the happy place, right? So actually, do you have a question off the back of that? So you were talking about how Facebook isn't necessarily entrenched, but they are increasingly like buying up loads of different apps that could help them kind of stay in mm -hmm. power. So like WhatsApp and, and Instagram, people have been talking about breaking up Facebook and its various like different entities, but actually, are you saying that the, the the sort of solution that you're advocating for is just more resilience in terms of social media and these different apps, no matter if it's Facebook or whatever else happens to come up? Yeah, more. How does this make me feel? How does, I mean, Tim, Tim Leary used to say, before you try a drug, look into the eyes of somebody who's on that drug and decide if that's somewhere you want to be. You know, that would be a great social media <laughs> test, right? Look at the eyes of someone going on Snapchat and see if that's a place, a place you want to be. Um, I'm arguing it's one solution. Yeah, break them up. That'd be great, you know? Break them up. I mean, platform monopolies are, are friggin' insane. Break up Amazon. Break up Google. Break up Facebook. These are you know, utilities at this point, of course. Of course, but if we don't, or until we have the, the, the legislative resolve to protect the public from the, the, the worst automated algorithmic forms of corporate capitalism, let's also um, re retrieve the human nervous system. If you realize that every medium you use is a drug, then you can think, do I want to be on Facebook right now? Do I want to be on Twitter? How does being on Google make me feel? And at least if you're consciously going online, rather than having your uh, uh, being online as a state of being, you know, then you end up much more empowered. I mean, think about when you go to a monastery, and there'll be these dudes there who aren't even speaking, right? They've gone on a vow of silence for a month. It's not because they're like saying, "Oh, I'm too egotistical, so I'm not going to speak." It's because they understand that language is software. That English, whatever language you're on, is an operating system. If you go off the operating system, then all of a sudden, things are no longer nouns. You're not subjects and objects and predicates. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. There's this way of experiencing the world outside language, which is more real and more pure. And, uh, and then when they go back, they go, OK, now I'm going to go back on language. And they're more aware of the way that language uh, 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 obscures uh, uh, their, their experience, their contact, their, their, their everything. It's the same with, with these technologies. So I'm going to take more questions. I'm going to take three this time. Um, so there's a woman in the front, um, a man behind her, and then a woman in this row over here. Hi. Very interesting stuff. You mentioned the arts, and also I'm talking about education as well, that um, things like acting, drama, um, at learning at school to communicate through conversations, debate, being in a group of people where you can actively experience close hand interaction with other people. That's something that's not happening in schools enough, I think. I don't know whether you agree with that. that and particularly something like acting, um, which obviously you, you're encouraged to think of yourself as someone else and uh, to be another 
that's, I think, some way to help them not immediately go onto the computer mm -hmm. straight away. Um, yeah, main, is this working? Many of the social justice issues are being played out in the workplace because it's very controllable. There's nothing more that the corporate people would like than people to be corporate zombies as they walk in through the, t the door. Do you think the social justice area and people are being played like violins by the corporations to dehumanize the workplace? Do I think that the... Do you think the corporations are playing the social justice issues to dehumanize the workplace? so that we become corporate zombies as you walk into their just jurisdiction. So like what would be an example that you're thinking of? Um, well, an extreme example might be in a controversial sexual harassment, for example, where they don't want anybody to uh, behave as they might do in terms of uh, flirting with the opposite sex, as you, you might in, in the everyday life. In, in, innocently, they, they, they're drawing the lines tighter and tighter so people don't behave normally in the workplace. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> and we just have one more question in the front. Um, I wanted to ask about or what you think of how algorithms are kind of trapping us in our echo chambers. So our realities on Facebook and social media, we're having the same conversations, we're hearing the same things repeated back to us all the time, and how this has, through the media at least, made you know, a sort of de dehumanizing of anyone who is other coming in and threatening us. So for example, the refugee crisis, they've been described as less than humans, you know, it's swarms and herds, it's not, you know, people. And I wonder how, um, how we can sort of change that through the media and through, I don't know, the algorithms actually, I don't know, pushing us not into the same circles of people, but to challenge our views and make us, you know, because the algorithms are inherently racist as well, they are, yeah. That's sort of what I wanted to say. Uh, um, all right, there's a lot. First, in terms of, of acting and theater, that's where I'm going next. I mean, theater's where I came from. You know, it wasn't until I was, you know, 30 that I started writing books, and it was only because I found theater so elitist. You know, I didn't want to be doing three-penny opera for 70 bucks. You know, it's what it cost to come to my production. I was like, what the, f you know? I saw theater, I was like a Clifford Odets kind of, you know, WPA lefty, you know, theater as, as uh, kind of good communist stuff. And it's like I was doing it for the wealthiest people in the world. And it just made no, it started, it stopped making sense. And the inter internet seemed like it would be the people's medium compared to the, the elitism of, of the places I was, I was directing theater. Um, and then, ugh, well, uh, it went the other way. But, but, no, I agree that theater, particularly local, non-scaled theater, theater, it's, it's interesting. My, my daughter saw um, Les Mis in the high school, in our high school, and then she saw Les Mis on Broadway, and she said, oh, I liked our high school production better. And I was like, why? And she said, because I knew the people who were in it. So for her, it was also seeing her friend playing this role. So it was not about... And, and it's funny, because that was like the original internet was never, video games was never about, oh, this is a great simulation of what it would be like to be shooting at asteroids. Right? And we somehow thought that that's the direction to go, so we created these simulations rather than these kind of uh, epic participatory experiences. So yeah, the theater that I want to do is not only helping people develop uh, uh, the sort of um, um, compassion for one another and understand what, what is it like to be in someone else's shoes and play their role, but I'm trying to write scenes that are so open for interpretation that people start to see that they are creating reality, that they have a script, but you could choose to do this scene, like if I do a scene between a worker and, work, uh, worker and boss, but I don't say where it's set. Where is it? Is it in the Tesco between someone putting uh, the stocks on the, on the shelves and the manager? Is it between uh, uh, Hagar and Abraham and the Bible? Is it between a stockbroker and the algorithm that's telling him what to do? You know, so where are you going to set this thing? And, and then how are you going to make sense of your scene in that set and setting? So yeah, I think theater, 
theater does a whole lot, you know, a whole lot. And yeah, and also because it's people embodying something rather than, rather than the classroom being this place for disembodied intellectual experiences to actually say, no, 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 something's happening. Let's get up on our feet and do this. It's like such a foreign thing in the classroom now. Let's, let's do that. But yeah, I'm totally there. We just don't fund it because who, what are you going to, what are you teaching them in theater? My kid's going to be an actor? No. Um, no, they're... Right. It doesn't cost much, but it costs the time. That they, you know, in the States, it's all about the time because now we're getting our, you know, no child left behind. Uh, uh, you've got to learn this amount of math and this amount of science and this amount of that uh, because, oh, look, the South Koreans are learning all this stuff and then they're going to beat us and their companies are going to go, uh, uh. um, So they lose it. So I'm, I'm all there. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, social justice in the workplace and all, I mean, pretty much anything corporations do is being done cynically. Right? Anything they do, if they do social justice, if they're doing sexual harassment, they're doing it because they're afraid to get in trouble. They don't want to get sued. Right? They, they're, they're not advanced enough to think about that um, in terms of, of social control. Like, uh, uh, they, they really, they're, these folks are not conscious in that way. I mean, I do know that there's the, the, the discomfort that people, particularly in America, have had with what they're calling the PC thing, where they're, they're, they can't say things anymore without one group or another uh, being offended by it. Um, it's, it is tricky, I'll admit. I mean, I'm, you go to a faculty meeting at, at CUNY, and I'll say something about a class, oh, well, you can say that because you're a privileged white male. It's like, oh, God, all right. But Grandma says we weren't white until 1971, you know, because we were Jews. Uh, but, oh, but now we are. Okay, good. Uh, you, know, you're not, you know, so it's like accept everything I say I'm saying because I'm a privileged white male, because I am a privileged white male. So I, I accept that, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's part of the reality. But um, I... I, I for me, the bigger problem in the way we're currently framing the social justice movement is, is in intersectionalism, certain intersections become more popular than others at certain times in the social justice debate. So at my, at my university, uh, you know, black and Hispanic and transgender intersections are talked about, but disabled people as an intersection are not talked about. So when I keep bringing them, because I worked in assistive technology for a while, when I bring disabled people into it, they'll say, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't count. That's not part of, of course it's part of this discussion. So it's like, how many, uh, how many groups and how do you talk about, how do you talk about everybody? And I, I do feel there's a certain way in which uh, certain kinds of granular intersectionalism dovetail really well with the kind of Facebookification of personal identity. And I, don't, I feel a little concerned when people get so far down a particular intersectional tunnel that they lose their sense of connection with all the other, the, all the other intersections that are out there. But uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to, to, to talk about because there's also certain people who have been more repressed than others. You know, we're still in the wake of what, you know, I wrote about it in, in the book, what the Native Americans called uh, Wetico. You know, this disease they thought that Westerners had, just to take everything and destroy everything. And there's this sense in the West that, well, we won. So why are you teaching these other cultures in school? Why are you presenting the loser cultures, you know, if our one won? And that's friggin' insane. It's like, oh, you won because you had the best weapons. Your culture had the best weapons. Does that mean it's the best culture? You know, maybe not. Maybe some other cultures that develop like permaculture maybe are going to be better at agriculture than people who look at the soil as an enemy to be, uh, uh, to be weaponized. Yep. And finally, um, the, the, the algorithmic uh, isolation of people and all, it, it's, it's funny. I, I'm thinking about the, the, the visual bias of the internet is really interesting to me because I feel like in America now, whoever can name the meme wins the meme. So you'll see pictures of Mexican uh, or not even, you know, uh, Central American 
immigrants, refugees walking through Mexico. And you know, you'll see a picture on the Guardian and they'll say, oh, look at these, you know, the refugees and immigrants. And then Trump will say, look at these terrorists invading. And the one that hits the reptile brain tends to win. So he's labeled the picture. Terrorists, terrorists, you know, a, a rapists, MS, whatever they are, 13. Um, less than human, animals. Again, what did Farah do when he talked about the Jews? It was like they were like uh, insects replicating. You dehumanize them so that you can justify killing them. But then in the States when this, um, an audio tape got out of the immigrant children in the detention camp and they played the audio tape and all of a sudden audio, the sound did something to people that the pictures didn't. Because pictures you can almost look at sort of objectively, but the sound hit people's bodies, the sounds of the crying children. And all of a sudden it became an issue. People cared. Their compassion got, got triggered in a way. It's as if the, 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 their, their bodies felt the vibration of the sound in a way that, that a, labeled, a, a labeled picture didn't do. Um, in answer to your question, though, what do we do about that? I think part of our problem in the progressive caring team human side is that we, we, don't res we don't see the dignity in the other. You know, and, and when I say find the others here, I don't just mean find the others who are like us. I mean find the other. Find the human in the other. You know, if you can't see the human being in the MAGA hat person, then how do you expect him to see the humanity in the Mexican across the wall? You, know, you, you can't. You can't. So, and that's hard. It's hard. How do you love that? I mean, and that's when it starts to get really, um, for lack of a better word, really Christian. You know, how do you, how, do you love, how do you love the person who hates you? How do you love the person who hates other humans? And by looking deep in there and seeing, well, what is the fear that they have that is energizing the hate? You know, and if you can understand, that, oh, look at this poor human being who is afraid, and how do I help them feel less afraid of me or of Mexicans or someone else? You know, but no, the algorithms are not there to do that because don't, you don't make money on that. Or you don't make money. That's really what it comes down to. If you spend time with another person, that's bad for the market. That's really what it comes down to. That's bad. There's no way to justify that with the market unless you're paying for the time with the other person. That's prostitution. That's something else. You know, it's bad. It's just bad for the market. The more that the, the happier people are, right? If you're, if you're getting laid, you don't need to buy fancy jeans. <laughs> so what does the fancy jeans company want, right? You not to get laid. And that's, that's the secret of capitalism. <laughs> That's a good note to end on. Um, so uh, we are afraid of time. So um, sadly, we're gonna have to wrap up now anyway. But thank you all for coming and for your excellent questions. If you didn't get a chance to ask your question, there will be a chance to meet Douglas Rushkoff in the foyer now, because you're gonna be staying on to sign some books. Cool. Um, and if you'd like to know about, more about the RSA, and in particular, our economic research strand, including our work on ethical AI, do sign up via our website for our events and projects newsletters, or head downstairs to our coffee house Rothmills for lunch or a coffee now. You're very likely to bump into a fellow or staff member there, and you can find out a little bit more about our current program and how you can get involved. So please join me once again for uh, thanking our terrific speaker, Douglas Rushkoff. Thank you.